Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome to the Armor of Faith, the show where we hope to bring our listeners closer to the Word of God and the blessings we receive through living in the fullness of the Catholic faith. My name is Doug, and I'll be your host today as we discuss the blessings of the Church Christ built upon Peter. And I'm also joined today by my panel, which includes Helen Hawkins uh, and my lovely wife, Sharon. And I should mention that Helen is a lay Dominican and has a love for music, uh, music ministry. And the Dominicans, I should also mention, are known as the Order of Preachers. Uh, Sharon is still our token cradle Catholic. And as everybody knows by now, I'm simply here to ask questions because what is an answer without a question? I'll let everyone ponder that meaningless philosophical thought for a while. Anyway. To answer my questions and correct my pronunciation is why we have our panelists. So welcome to our panelists as well as to our listeners. And we also have a special guest today, uh, and that is Michelle Mason, uh, who is the local coordinator for the 40 Days for Life effort in Colorado Springs, uh, Colorado. And she's been involved in pro-life ministry for 15 years, praying at the sidewalk, participating in sidewalk advocacy, representing her parish in the Diocesan uh, Respect Life Ministry, and promoting the work of a local pregnancy center. So also a big welcome to Michelle as she joins our panel today. And Michelle, we're very, very glad to have you. Let us open with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we lift up our hearts in thanks and praise for this opportunity to open and share your holy word this day. We pray that you are with us and all our listeners as we share with one another the blessings of faith. We pray you will grant us wisdom and understanding as we seek to learn your holy truth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. So last time I mentioned that the journey of our life begins at conception. At that moment, our first cell is formed and our journey of life is put into motion. The remaining stages of life are a matter of maturity until our natural death. Within that spectrum from conception until natural death, Human hands should not be the intentional cause of life's end. We must remember that though life may be taken away by human choice, it cannot be restored by human hand. The temptation of some who subscribe to the culture of life is to view those who subscribe to the culture of death as evil. And indeed, St. John Paul II described the battle between the culture of life and the culture of death as a battle between good and evil. But we must also consider that there is a difference between individuals and a culture. We must consider that the people who wittingly or unwittingly subscribe to the culture of death are misled by or seduced to the culture to which they subscribe. And of course, they also believe that we are the ones who are misled as we fail to comprehend the nobleness of their belief in solutions of death. So the tendency is for the conversation to become rather hostile from both sides. We must remember that those who accept the culture of death are still children of God. Therefore, we must remember that our call is not to judge and condemn. Rather, our call is to defend life and encourage everyone to respect for the sanctity of life. Towards this end, we must also remember our call to approach every child of God with humility, civility, dignity, and respect. As we continue our discussions during this series, we must remember the behavior to which we are called. As we work to defend life and promote the sanctity of life, we must consider the perceptions we form in others, not only by our words, but also by what we do. The last time we discussed the spectrum of the culture of death, but today we're going to discuss opportunities where we, where we may engage the efforts to defend life. Of course, one of the major battlegrounds between the cultures of death and life is abortion. And that will be our main focus today, but I also want to take a moment to consider the larger picture. So last time we mentioned that while we focus our efforts to defend life in relation to one portion of the spectrum of life, we should still make ourselves aware of the spectrum of issues from conception until natural death. 
The question I would have for our panel is, why might it be important for us to maintain awareness of the full spectrum of life and death? So life is precious at all stages, and all of us are made in the image of God, and we need to look at each other as God looks at us. Um, every single one of us is precious. The, the tiny baby who has just been conceived to the elderly person who's on his deathbed, um, the teenager who is going through a lot of troubles, uh, just everyone um, we encounter. We, we have to remember that. Our, our friends, the people who we disagree with, um, all of those people are made in the image of God, and, and we just need to remember from conception until natural death. Um, we need to respect all those lives. And Michelle, as you, as you engage people in discussions, do you, uh, do you sometimes find that we, I mean, it's kind of natural because of the political rage for us to talk about abortion, um, but do you, do you also find um, other questions that may come up there in relation to other stages of life? Um, there's, there are all kinds of questions that are always uh, occurring, um, like in vitro fertilization. How, how is that good? How is that bad? What, what is good or bad about that? Um, euthanasia, the whole idea of what they call mercy killing, um, that's something that's really coming into our culture right now. Um, even in Colorado, they just approved um, assisted suicide last year, and it, it's already happening. I mean, you don't hear about that so much these days, but it's happening. I, I know of a woman who actually took her, her nephew to the emergency room, and it was a, a certain hospital, um, not a Catholic hospital, but another one, and, and he was in a lot of pain. He struggles with depression, and they offered him the, the pill the, the, to, to commit suicide, and she was in shock. We were all in shock that they would do that, but, but it's something that's happening that we're not always hearing about, and that's, that's kind of the other end of, of the spectrum that, that's happening in our culture today. Well, you know, my uh, husband had uh, open heart surgery a couple of years ago, and when he went in to uh, talk to the doctor about it, that wasn't he's seventy. He was seventy two at the time. That was offered as an option if you don't want to go through this. You know, you're seventy two years old. Uh, you've lived a full life, and we were shocked. I mean, especially considering that his father was still alive at 98 and doing well. To be offered that was, was, was a real shock and, and not a very pleasant one either. Yeah, I can yeah, imagine if is. I was sitting there coming for someone's help and the, the help they offered me is, is to, yeah, um, yeah. I, don't, I don't know that I would have been, been comfortable then saying, yeah, go ahead and do the surgery. I would be concerned. <laughs> that they wouldn't want to do the surgery right. Wow, I didn't realize that. Well, I don't think the doctor was all that keen on it. It's part of part of the culture where they are expected to and almost have to offer all possible things. The doctor seemed uncomfortable with it also. Mm. In other words, he uh, was, was this with the... Um, Veterans Administration? No, this was before he was involved with oh, the VA. Okay. Um, because what I suspect is, is that they have a checklist of things that they questions they have to ask and and um, and I guess options they have to offer uh, because of changes in in various laws, and and that's you know part of the concern as far as how the culture of death kind of continues to creep in and we have to be aware of the, the spectrum because uh, even though we may be focused in a certain area, uh, we may volunteer in, in a certain area, we still in our day-to-day -day lives have opportunities where we can influence the heart of another. We may have a one-on-one -on -one discussion opportunity uh, with a family member or sometimes even a complete stranger. We, you know, we just don't know. But if we were prepared for the discussion, 
then we are better able to defend life. If we're not aware of the spectrum, we can kind of get in shock by it. Sometimes emotionalism can kind of take us over, and then unintentionally, uh, we find ourselves in, in the position of just solidifying another heart in another direction because we weren't really prepared to to talk to, to, to them from a compassionate perspective. And of course, the other thing too is, is that as we do engage uh, people that are relatively activist in discussion, um, they they have a tendency of when they don't feel like they're making progress in one area, they're going to start attacking you in another. Um, you know, I find that in, in just talking about the sanctity of life, um, you know, the, the first effort is to try to convince us it's not really a life yet. Uh, and then once we talk about the biology of it and that falls flat, then it's a matter of, well, we start demonizing, and we demonize in a variety of ways. So being aware uh, of this also enables, enables us to be prepared um, to be able to, start to discuss the issue with compassion and, again, to be able to uh, express the importance of life. And that once death graces us, it's, it's something that cannot be changed after the fact. And also, you know, too, um, you know, I, I'm a tendency of a, of a person who looks at things from a military perspective since I was a military man and all those, those types of things. When you're, when you're engaged in, in a conflict, knowing the larger picture also helps you in understanding the importance of the area that you're, you're engaging. Uh, and so that's, it's always my recommendation to folks that are, who are engaged um, in supporting uh, one particular portion of the spectrum is to still make yourself aware of the range of issues that we're battling uh, as we're battling a, a culture of death. So during our previous discussions, uh, we mentioned First uh, Peter chapter three verse nine, where we're told, "Do not return evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, a blessing, because to this you are called, that you might inherit a blessing." So why is the demeanor of our word and deed important as we seek to encourage a culture of life? Oh, this this one is really, really, um, really important, really key in what we do because, like you said, if, if you come at, at something angry with emotionalism and, and you're yelling at someone or screaming, they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to see you as a loving person when, when you're lashing out at them. And we see that at the sidewalk when we pray out there for 40 days for life. Um, I don't know if you guys were able to see the movie Unplanned, but it's just like in the movie. There's there's a group out there that's praying peacefully and trying to talk to the women in regular tone voices, and then there's another group who's out there screaming and, and shouting horrible things at, at the women going in and, and just yelling at them. And, and we've had that happen at, at our sidewalk, too, here in, in Colorado Springs. They, they, there are certain people who go out who, who scream at the women, and, and they just... If, if you or I were being screamed at by someone, I mean, we're not going to turn around and go talk to them. We're, we're going to run away. And, and so that's not the way to, to, to reach people. And another thing is kind of, kind of like the same thing on Facebook. When we get on social media and we get into these arguments with people we don't know and, and people are saying bad things about each other and, and all trying to prove their point, what – what we really need to do is we need to show these women, we need to show everyone that they're loved. And once you establish a connection with them that they're loved, then, then you can have a conversation. Or sometimes people aren't ready for that. Sometimes people yell back at you no matter what you do. But, but anyway, you still come at them with that calm demeanor, with, with love in your heart to be able to try to reach them. Yeah, and that's, that's one of the things that we've talked about before on, on uh, this show as well, is, is that as we engage others, it's really not a matter of are we winning or losing an argument. What we want to be able to do is preserve the opportunity for the continuation of the conversation. And we may be surprised sometimes. We think, well, somebody's just walked away from us, and, and so that's it. We're done. 
but we might be surprised that because of something that we said and the compassion by which it was said, that it causes them to, to think about it, process it, and suddenly we, we, we see someone coming back to us for more of a conversation. Have you ever, how have you experienced that, Michelle? Um, yeah, that happens. Um, we like to call it planting seeds because we, we'll say something, something to someone and they may not take it. They may not take it right that time. They, they may be angry. They, it may be a person who, okay, I'll think about it. You know, we have all different kinds of responses, but, but we just call it planting seeds. You know, all we can do is what we can do, and God's the one that does the work in their heart. And he's the one that's ultimately going to change their, their hearts and their minds. And, and, of course, you also brought up social media. And that's, that's kind of an uh, interesting environment uh, out there as well, when you, particularly in, in places like Twitter and Facebook. Um, because the conversations we may have with another, sometimes we don't always remember there's other people that read those things. And mm-hmm. so sometimes if, you know, if you're engaged with a, some of it you obviously start to recognize as being an, a, an activist because, you know, the conversation starts, but then after you start making certain points, all of a sudden you get all these memes and good things like that thrown at you. Um, you, you and, of course, you may check their feed, and all of a sudden you find nothing but activist <laughs> propaganda <Yeah>. in there. <laughs> Again, you know you're yeah, not going to convert. I found yeah, myself not... sucked into those discussions before, and, and I, I back up and I'm like, wait, what am I doing? This is not doing any good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know you're not going to convert the heart of the activist. But that True. is not always the point. You, there's a lot of other people observing the conversation. So the demeanor by which you approach that conversation is part of the way that, you know, partly how people – uh, evaluate the conversations. Um, I remember um, a priest talking about a situation with uh, Dr. Peter Kreft, who was invited to their seminary, which was a which was not a Catholic seminary, but it was a seminary of another denomination, uh, for a debate um, on Catholicism, and and the priest said that he remembers the debate. Uh, from the perspective that, Peter, that Dr. Kraft was um, calm, cool, composed, and his answers were, were formed with compassion. But he remembered the attempt of, of the other person trying to demonize him from every perspective. Uh, and actually, it wasn't just this priest, but several other seminarians observed that behavior as well. And apparently that day, Dr. Kreft left with several, several seminarians that decided to become seminarians in the Catholic Church. Uh, oh, wow. So it's a, it, it's a matter of how you present um, your perspective. And like I say, it's not a matter of winning or losing an argument. Uh, when we're talking about matters of life, we're really talking about the opportunity of being able to preserve a conversation that will ultimately preserve life as well. So one our, of, our one demeanor, of my favorite. Yeah, one of my favorite scenes when I find myself getting hot under the collar or discussing something with somebody I really disagree with is never argue with a fool. Bystanders cannot tell the difference. And <laughs> if you are arguing with someone that you think is a fool, you can darn well bet that the people that are listening to this argument can't tell the difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the nature by which we, we react. Um, if I'm being abusive towards somebody, or let's look at it from a different perspective, if you watch somebody being abusive to somebody, are you kind of like saying, gosh, yeah, I want to go up and have a conversation with them. <laughs> I want that abuse too. <laughs> <laughs> But also, as you mentioned, sometimes what we have to be aware of is, is, is um, we don't want to allow ourselves to be pulled into the mud. And, and I think that's firmly what's behind First Peter 3, 
9, which says, do not return evil for evil or insult for insult, because that's all we're doing is just pulling each other down in, in, into the mud. And the other side of it, too, is in my experience with, with activism back during the Cold War, uh, one, of the, one of the tactics always was, since, since I was um, um, uh, in, engaged in defending military installations as a military police officer, one of the tactics constantly uh, directed at us was to try to provoke a response. Uh, a response that could then be used and turned against us. Um, in, in other words, they wanted to provoke um, uh, our brutality or, or something along those lines. And so that was one of the things that we had to carefully train uh, our soldiers on, uh, our military policemen on, as they, as they uh, stood to protect our installations, is that they needed to be aware of those provocations. and and they needed to keep their emotions in check, and that they needed to avoid, those uh, re avoid responding to those provocations. Because all that ends up doing is, is giving ammunition to emotionalism. And when we are trying to divert people from reasoned logic, then the first thing we do is try to provoke their emotions. And we see that out there on social media every day. And we have to be aware of that. We also, again, like I say, when we do engage people in conversations, the most important part of that is being able to continue the conversation. And to be able to do it, uh, even though we're talking about very serious matters, we still want to be able to do it so that we can, can come to, um, we, we analyze problems from the perspective of what is right and just in terms of the solutions, so that we aren't uh, approaching problems from the standpoint of emotionalism, because my experience is, is that when emotions run high, the quality of our communication, coordination, collaboration, and decision-making, and ultimate problem-solving suffers. And that's not an easy thing to do to keep our emotions in check. <laughs> I mean, this is a lot easier for me to say uh, than for us always to do, but it's something that we always have to keep in the back of our mind and something that, that we should carefully practice. Well, you know, Doug, since uh, I've been talking with you over the last few years, I find myself on the social media not so much addressing uh, those who disagree with me, but addressing those that do d agree with me and trying to teach them these very things, people that uh, carry, carry my same ideals and whatnot, sometimes use terrible language, and it's it's them anymore that I'm trying to adjust tactics in how they want to express themselves. Um, so I, I really do appreciate what you have taught us on that, on, on being aware of what, is, what provokes us. I'm glad we're on radio so nobody sees me blushing. Uh, <laughs> so, so in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, we're told, but even if you should suffer because of righteousness, blessed are you. Do not be afraid or terrified with fear of them, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks you for a reason for your hope, but do it with gentleness and reverence, keeping your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who defame your good conduct in Christ may themselves be put to shame. So I think that's a good summary to, to um, what we were just discussing. But now that brings another question, because I just provided scripture as a means for us to understand the demeanor to which we're called as we engage one another. And of course, that's because as a matter of our belief in God, we have a common understanding of the authority of scripture. While knowledge of scripture is helpful to what is in our heart, why might it be counterproductive to our efforts to communicate to the heart of another? How can we approach the discussion when we do not have a common belief in God? So that's a good question because um, my daughter who is in college right now, one of my daughters, um, the majority of the, the students that she goes to school with, they, 
they either don't believe in God or they don't go to church or, you know, the culture has changed to a point where you mention a Bible verse or, or you quote scripture and half of them don't know what you're talking about. And also it, it is kind of to somebody um, who isn't raised in that culture and, and, and isn't believing in God or the word of God, um, for them to hear someone quoting scripture at them sounds like they're preaching. It sounds like you're preaching at them. And nobody wants to be preached at. It, it, we have to come from a different standpoint. Um, we have to come from the standpoint of just loving on these people. And I know it it may sound strange. Okay, here's a stranger. I'm going to love on you or whatever. And uh, But it's um, just showing them compassion. When we do sidewalk advocacy and, and the cars pull in um, very briefly, we have a very brief amount of time where we can, can talk to them and we, we have eye contact with them. We try to make a connection with them and we ask them, you know, do you need help? Are you going into Planned Parenthood? Do you, do you need help? And, and we, we give them the help that they need, but we, we establish a connection with them. We try to. And preaching at them would, would really turn most of them off, I would, I would say. Maybe not all of them, but I think a good part of them. I think it would sort of depend on the scripture. There are scriptures like uh, Peter 3, the one that uh, Doug just spoke, that is aimed at Christians. This is how you need to behave because you are a Christian. You wouldn't want to to try to do that with somebody who is not a Christian. That that's commandments to us. But there are so many beautiful passages, especially in the Psalms and whatnot, speaking of beauty and uh, of joy and of happiness. And there's so many absolutely beautiful pieces of scripture that might be appropriate rather than a command. To, to discuss the beauty of life. Yeah, I, I think it's all how you approach it. You know, all, how you come, if you're standing there with your Bible, you know, quoting scripture and stuff, then you're going to be looked at differently than if, if you're doing as, as you say, you know. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I know what you're saying because I know I've, I've been on the receiving end on that too. Standing there with your, your Bible in your hand, thumping it is not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it can it can give the appearance of of judgment. And so someone in turmoil, the last thing that they're seeking is judgment. What they're seeking is is help. And so if they feel like all we're offering is judgment, then um, then we immediately push them push them away. The other thing that I kind of see out there too is. Uh, you know, as Michelle mentioned, the culture has changed. So there may be fewer people that do have that common understanding of Scripture, you know, as a, as a means of communication, if you will. And, and of course, there's a uh, growing group that kind of says, you know, they've been conditioned to that Scripture, so what? It's just a book of myths. It's not really real. What has just happened to our conversation at that point? Um, I think uh, we need to come at it from a scientific standpoint, really, because even though they may not be on the same page with us concerning the Bible, a lot of young people today especially um, look to science, and, and if you tell them, you know, look, go Google, um, all the scientists agree, um, birth, or a life begins at conception, and they Google it, find out, and, oh, yeah, it, it is in the science. And, and once you come at it from that standpoint, I think a lot of the young people today are being converted because that's how they're looking at it. And that's a starting point um, to have the conversation, to, to eventually get to, you know, talking about God, talking about Scripture. But you have to start somewhere, and, and you have to start on the same page that they're at. We have to start where people are and then slowly move towards, towards where God is calling them to be. 
And and I think that's one of the things that we have to consider is the, is the environment in which we are in. And that environment, you know, can be it, it's a lot different for Michelle, as you mentioned, when you only have a couple of seconds to make a connection when somebody happens to be just, you know, driving by, slowing down maybe just enough to make on, eye contact, maybe stopping for a second, and you just have a moment to be able to make a connection, uh, to be able to have perhaps a longer conversation. If somebody comes into a pregnancy resource center, um, there may be a little bit longer opportunity to do that, but it's still it's still one of the first things that we're trying to do in the conversation is gain a connection so we have the opportunity to talk. But there's another important part about a conversation and, you know, thinking of the communication model, what an, what's another element of the conversation other than just talking? Just well, our body language. language. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, just offering them help, um, which is what we do. We have a pregnancy center right up the street, and, and we offer them help. We tell them about the free help that's up the street as opposed to Planned Parenthood, who makes you pay for everything. And that we are, we're able to get a lot of people to turn around and go to the pregnancy center instead simply because it's free, you know, because of all the donations that have come in from people, and, and they don't have to charge. Mm-hmm. And I, and perhaps, also, perhaps a lot of people are not aware of that, um, that, that uh, pregnancy centers are free. And maybe that's, that's something that we need to promote a little bit more. Um, because, uh, you know, young, young gals who are in, you know, they're in an, in an interesting to, in, in position. They're scared. They don't know what to do. Sometimes they don't even know if they're pregnant for sure, and they, they have gone to find out if they are. And I think a lot of people are under the opinion that when they go to Planned Parenthood, it's free. But Yeah, I think you're right. I, yeah, I think, I think people I, – I, I've had two experiences with the pregnancy center with my daughters, and they were so helpful and so kind. And the first one was with the first time really was was important because um, my son and his wife had they'd been married I don't know a short time and he had a job that he went to work one day and found the doors shut and locked and so he had to go find another job and at the same time my daughter-in-law found out she was pregnant scared to death and. So together we went over to the pregnancy center there in Colorado Springs, and they could not have been any nicer to her. Just wonderful. And um, it, as it, it went, because of the loss of the job, they were without insurance for about three months, and especially when you're having your first pregnancy. And when he did get insurance because of his big existing condition, yeah. then there was no insurance help. So yeah, it was it was pretty tough, but the people at the pregnancy center were absolutely wonderful. But I can tell you, when we went, we did not know if we were going to get a bill. We weren't sure what was going to happen, and I think that's something that really needs to be promoted more. Um, you know, with with greater um, enthusiasm, I guess, so that people, so that these young gals who are who are concerned will turn around and, and go find the pregnancy center instead of Planned Parenthood. Oh, yeah, course, definitely. Things, I think one of the things we also have to remember is this is that everybody comes to us with a unique problem. And so, therefore, when we engage in a conversation, we do have to remember to listen because we have to listen for what is the concern of that person, what is the fear of that person, and then as we, as we learn their perceptions, that enables us to be able to provide uh, conversations that help them walk through solutions and, and the options that are before them, and that not not everything is a uh, overwhelming or monumental uh, problem that cannot be solved. 
So then also, as, you know, as we consider this uh, approach where we're talking with, with people, we may be coming at it from a, uh, a perspective of uh, because of our faith, we have such a respect for life. But as Michelle mentioned, we, we do need to, we, we probably make more ground if we're talking from uh, a common area of understanding. And one of the common areas of understanding that we have is this is the common understanding of, our, of biology. And, and as Michelle also pointed out there, um, it's, uh, you go to the, uh, the National Pediatrics Association, you go to, to you know, others that look at it from a scientific perspective, conception is where life begins. And so therefore, what we are discussing at that point is a life in motion, a life that's maturing. And therefore, we have to, the, the conversation uh, then becomes more, more about uh, how we are going to be able to uh, enable this, this life. And it also comes down to a conversation eventually um, when, we, when we do converse with others that um, we're, we're trying to defend the most defenseless among us uh, in there. So, and kind of when, when someone's pushing at, uh, back to us, you know, one of the questions that, that may be is, is that, so what happens when we become the one who is weak? What happens when the conversation becomes about our life? Um, who do we want to have advocate for us? Somebody that is, is saying, just end it? Um, or someone is saying, let's find solutions to continue it. So now what we discussed, how the quoting of scripture can be counterproductive to the discussion with someone who does not believe in God as we do, uh, still our understanding of scripture does have a value, as, as Helen was pointing out. So what might that value be? Oh, I, I turn to scripture all the time when I'm, when I'm going out to the sidewalk just in daily life because God speaks to us every day. And it's just amazing to me how how he gives you what you need exactly when you need it. And, and it's, it's just really amazing. It shouldn't surprise me because he does it all the time. But, but when I'm in like a really sad place or, or, or whatever's going on in my own life, then he gives me just exactly what I need. And I think he does it with, with all of us as long as we, we open the word and, and turn to it. When we um, kicked off our 40 Days for Life this, this time, um, I felt God calling me, okay, we need to, to kick it off with a Bible verse and have the time that we do the kickoff based on that Bible verse. And, and so we did, and, and we looked to the Bible. And, and so for our kickoff, we did, it was Ephesians 6, uh, um, and it's finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And then it goes on to say, put on the whole armor of God and, and the verses that, that followed, telling us what we need to do to stand firm, what we need to do to, to have the Lord's, Lord's strength. And, and I, we, led, we started the 40 Days for Life with that, and, and I, it was an inspiration from God because during the, the 40 days, there were many times that I had to, to lean on that and depend on that, and God, this is really tough. What, what are we going to do now? And, and, and just over and over again, and I even had one of our nights at night, the guys who go pray in the middle of the night when it's dark and lonely, and, and even he said, he, he said one night it was just really, really tough. And, and he said, I, I turned to that scripture, and, and it really, really helped me. It, it gave me strength, and I, and I could finish my, my hour, and I could, I could go on. And, and, and God just does that all the time, and, and I, I really could not make it, you know, without his word to mm-hmm. de- depend on. Yeah, it, it's something mm-hmm. Sharon's watching me with this huge smile on my face because, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. Ephesians 6, that was, um, that's actually how we introduced this show. It, and obviously, it's the armor of faith, and it's, it's about putting on the armor of God. It's about uh, knowing our faith um, so that we are better able to, to live it. Uh, so it's, it's rather interesting that you kick that off uh, with, with putting on the armor of God, and now you're on that show. <laughs> 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 well, things don't happen by accident, do they? Um, no, they don't. But, but I do think that, that, is, that she brought up something that is extremely important, is, is, is that um, 
you know, one of the, one of the things that we have a tendency of doing sometimes uh, is throwing scripture at one another as little rocks or bombs to, to make political points or, or fulfill personal agendas. But it it is it also is an important element of our comfort in life because there is so many so much wisdom that's contained within those words. And if we allow that scripture to guide us in our relationships, um, then we're able to produce that demeanor that we've just talked about earlier, that we're able to approach one another with humility, civility, dignity, and respect, and that we understand the purpose that's behind that and, uh, and how it actually leads to better outcomes uh, when we're able to do that. Another reason why I think knowing our faith and knowing the scripture behind our faith is because when we, when we do find ourselves in situations where we're facing the activists, one of the things I constantly experience is they start throwing scripture at us. Or the other thing is, is they try to justify the position of death through scripture by taking it out of context. I see that happen all, all the time. I see that out on, out on the Internet. And sometimes, again, it's not a matter of um, a, trying to change the heart or mind of the activist, but it may be somebody that is reading what the activist is putting out there. And it enables us to give them the counter argument. You know, when they start saying, but so-and-so told me that, and, and then they quote you this line of scripture. You're able to provide a fuller context because you not only know the lines that they may be throwing at you, but you also know the greater context in which that scripture exists. And therefore, uh, we're able to put the full context together. Uh, you know, the example that we've given before uh, on this show is, the, um, is uh, Jesus' temptation in the desert. And uh, Satan tempted him with scripture. But of course, being the word made flesh, Jesus was able to, be, was able to respond in each case with the full context as we observe that, that conversation. And so we have to be prepared from that perspective as well. And the other thing we should consider is, is that if we do have someone coming that's in a crisis situation and, and they are of the same faith, then it can be consoling to them, but it all, we also have to be very careful. Uh, again, we don't want to uh, approach them from a perspective where they feel like uh, we're presenting scripture to them as a means of judgment because that's not what we uh, are being called to do. We're being called to, to care for one another um, with love and compassion. So one of the most visible places that we might observe where people gather to advocate for life is on the sidewalk in front of abortion clinics. But as we mentioned, there is a spectrum where our gifts, talents, or calling may enable the culture of life in other areas and other perspectives. So where might we get involved if, if we're wanting to be able to support life? What are our opportunities? And, and one of the ways, I mean, what, it's, it's what I do since I'm the leader of the 40 Days for Life in Colorado Springs is we do go pray at the sidewalk because that's, that's where it's happening. It's happening right there in the abortion clinic. And, and um I know some people do pray at home. We have some elderly people who can't get out who pray at home, and, and that is necessary too. It's very necessary because we need the support of the people praying at home. But going out to the sidewalk is crucial because these women going in, they, they see us out there, and they change their minds. And, and it's amazing. Uh, the, the movie Unplanned, in the movie, they, Abby Johnson said that, that when people are praying at the sidewalk, up to 75% of the abortion appointments are canceled. So that is huge. Up to 75% of the abortion appointments are canceled when somebody's praying out at the sidewalk. So people see us, and whether their, their conscience is triggered or whether they see us as, as someone who cares, which we do, then they change their minds. And most of the time, we don't even hear about it. We, we don't even know these stories. Occasionally, we're, we'll hear about babies who are saved, moms who come back and, and say, I didn't have the abortion because you guys were standing here praying for me, and I saw you. And, and, 
And I had no idea looking. the figure was that high. It is, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. I it's, heard it's, Abby Johnson on the radio the other day. Um, she was speaking from the National uh, Prayer Breakfast. And she was talking about that fact that, you know, that 75%. Um, that well, the, 75%. Yeah. The, the, yeah. She said, we know the difference when you are out on the right. sidewalk. <laughs> that, that, up, that, that up to 75% of the people who were planning to come have abortions changed their mind. And, and that's really important. I thought it was really interesting because I, we did go see the movie Unplanned, and, and it was fabulous. And you know what else is interesting is that the theaters put it out and said it'll be out for one weekend. Well, in Grand Junction, it's now in its third weekend. And they're getting ready to be the third weekend, I believe. And they had originally only planned to have two days, and they would show two shows each day, and they were at 7 and 9 o'clock at night. And by the time we got ready to go that first weekend, they not only opened up another theater for it, they, they had added two more time slots. And it was still yeah. only going to be the two days, and now they're at three weeks. So um, people, people got the message that this was an important movie to be seen. Yeah, yeah they did. And, Michelle, can you talk about the sidewalk counselors? Because uh, they are... You know that's a that's a it's a tough job. It really requires a lot of people skills, but it also requires some training. Can you tell us a little bit about the counselors? We do. We have a sidewalk advocates for life training that that Julie Bailey does here in Colorado Springs, and other cities have this have the same. They have different chapters of sidewalk advocates for life, and what we do is we stand outside the abortion clinic and we have information for the women going in. Um, and we try to get them to stop. Now, here in Colorado Springs, it's a little bit tougher because we're like a block away from the abortion clinic. There's a, a driveway that, we, that they have to drive through and go into the clinic, so, so we're not able to just use a regular voice and, and talk to them, and they're right there going in. Um, we have to briefly, like seconds, stop them as they're turning off the big street into the private driveway, and we have a few seconds to ask them, are you going into Planned Parenthood? Would, would you like some help? There's a, a center right up the street where they have free services, free pregnancy tests, and, and we have that, that brief time. We have a goodie bag to give to them, and we give them the goodie bag if they take it with chocolates and all sorts of good stuff. And then they take the, the pamphlet that we have, and we tell them about the pregnancy center. And it's totally legal. We've checked with the police, and we do have that, that brief time that we're able to talk to them. And if, if we tell them, if you'd like to talk to us, then pull into this center right here, and, and we can talk with you. And sometimes people do that, and we have a little bit more time. A lot of times um, women will take the information, and go on into Planned Parenthood. And, but we know we've gotten the information into their hands. That while they're waiting, they're probably reading the pamphlet, and some of them come back out and, and talk to us or go back to the, and go to the pregnancy center. And we do have women who, who turn around right then and there after they find out about the free services and go straight to the pregnancy center. And in our, our next show, we'll end up talking uh, more specifically about pregnancy resource centers, but that's also another area where people can go to volunteer. They need a variety of skills there. Uh, and also, you know, if you're finding yourself in a position that, well, I can't really volunteer a lot of time, but one thing that they need are, are baby items. So either donations in terms of, of uh, money or, or uh, if they have a list of things that they want to keep on hand, to be able to help expectant mothers either in terms of maternity, maternity items or baby items uh, are areas of donation possibilities. And then, of course, is, you know, we're talking about a spectrum of life. So as we try to save a life at the sidewalk and we're able to then um, uh, have a deeper conversation in the Pregnancy Resource Center, we're, we are then able to uh, enable a woman to, to keep her, her child 
we still have to look at the, the remaining spectrum of life there. And so there's a parenting support programs where they need people who can, can teach and present. Um, there's also uh, there's also women who need help who have already been through an abortion and are dealing with uh, the emotional aftermath uh, of that. Crisis counseling. Um, the, and, and the, I don't. I don't want to yeah. interrupt. I just wanted to see. I, I wanted to address the post-abortion women um, personally, just to just to share an experience I had. Um, so when I first started going out to the sidewalk. And I, I, 11 years ago, when I started leading a 40 Days for Life effort, then my goal, I mean, in my mind, this is how I thought, we're going to save babies, which, of course, that's what we do. But that was like I was focused on, on only that. And God just really, he really touched my heart. As I, as I saw the women going in and I made eye contact with some of them going in, I could I could feel their anguish. I could feel their he just really opened my eyes to this isn't just about saving babies. It is about saving babies, but but he let me know these are my daughters. These are my daughters who are in pain and who are hurting and who need help. And and I just it opened up a whole new world of of wow, this isn't just about saving babies. There are women out there who are in pain, and I didn't even realize, you know, these women are going into these centers. They're going in because a lot of them don't feel like they have an option. Some of them are coerced into going in. Some of them are are forced to. Some of them don't know the whole truth. They're told that it's it's just tissue and it's not a baby yet, and, and they're told these things, and... And I just want the women out there and the men who have also been involved in abortion to know God absolutely loves you more than you could even ever imagine. He sees you as his son. He sees you as his daughter. And, and he wants you to come home. And those of you who, who haven't been to confession over a past abortion, please go see a priest. Go to confession. Those of you who are Protestant or evangelical, go talk to a pastor and receive a blessing from him. God's forgiveness is so immense that we cannot even begin to understand it. We have divine mercy Sunday coming up this Sunday, and, and he wants all of his, his daughters and sons with him. And I just, I just encourage um, women who have not been through post-abortion counseling, if you haven't been and you've had an abortion or the men who have been involved, go to post-abortion counseling. There's, um, all you have to do is Google hopeafterabortion.com and, and find out where it is near you in, in all of the states. It'll, it'll show and you can find out. But um, a lot of women have gone to confession and they can't forgive themselves. And I just have to say, if, if God can forgive you, you need to forgive yourself. He, he's forgiven you. Don't listen to the words that Satan tells you that taking you back to that time, taking you back and, and um, making you relive this over and over again. He, he's telling you lies. You, you need to listen to God and, and listen to God who loves you and and who wants you to forgive yourself so that you can so that you can move on and and I pray I pray for all of you who have had an abortion that that you receive the help and you receive the healing that that God calls for you that God wants you to have and you bring and just, up an important point to tell about uh, discernment um, in that even as we look at so where where can I help but I know I don't have the skills to to be a sidewalk counselor, for example, uh, or something along those lines. The advice that I would give to folks is take a moment to discern not all the skills are needed inside the Pregnancy Resource Center. Sometimes it's legal advocacy. Sometimes it's media advocacy. Sometimes it's even political advocacy uh, that is required in this this overall battle, uh, if you will. So examine what skills you have, but then also, as Michelle mentioned, listen to where God's guiding you. 
And it can be say, well, I'm, I'm not trained in it, or I can come up with any excuse of why I shouldn't get involved. But the reality is, is, is if I if I go and ask somebody, how can I help? Believe me, that they'll they'll invite us in. And and as Michelle mentioned, you'll you'll be surprised that you'll be given what you need when you need it. So some some quotes I'd like to share with you as we draw to a close here. John Paul II or St. John Paul II, uh, in his Evangelium Vitae. Did I get that right this time? <laughs> okay. The Gospel of Life said, Respect for life requires that science and technology should always be at the service of man and its integral development. Society as a whole must respect, defend, and promote the dignity of every human person at every moment and every condition at that person's life. He also said, not only is the fact of the destruction of so many human lives still to be born or in their final stage extremely grave and disturbing, but no less grave and disturbing is the fact that conscience itself, darkened as it were by such widespread conditioning, is finding it increasingly difficult to distinguish between good and evil in what concerns the basic value of human life. He also told us, never tire of firmly speaking out in defense of life from its conception, and do not be deterred from the commitment to defend the integrity of every first human person with courageous determination. And so some final thoughts. During the course of our discussion today, we mentioned the importance of our awareness of the full spectrum of the cultures of life and death, even though our engagement is primarily concerning only one segment of the spectrum. We also pointed out the importance of our demeanor in both word and deed, as well as opportunities for us to support and encourage a culture of life. As St. John Paul II highlighted in his encyclical Evangelium Vitae, he said, this situation with its lights and shadows ought to make us all fully aware that we are facing an enormous and dramatic clash between good and evil, death and life, the culture of death and the culture of life. We find ourselves not only faced with, but necessarily in the midst of this conflict. We are all involved, and we all share in it with the inescapable responsibility of choosing to be unconditionally pro-life. So during our opening to the show, I related that as we engage this battle of life and death, we must also consider that there is a difference between individuals and a culture. As I mentioned, a culture exists as long as there are hearts which believe in it and support it. A person, however, can change the direction of their heart. As hearts are changed, the direction of a culture can be influenced as well. I can testify that I once firmly had both feet planted within the culture of death. It was the way I was socialized in public school, through my university education, and as a result of my engagement within a secular society. Fortunately for me, God steered people into my path to help open my eyes both physically and spiritually. It didn't happen overnight or through one conversation. It came as a result of many things, but perhaps the most important influence was loving hearts which engaged me but did not judge me. I can't really remember what brought me to the sidewalk the first time, but I do know the spark was a simple invitation. I'm not even sure I knew what to expect. I was not trained in any way. I didn't talk to anyone. I didn't hold a sign. And I certainly never served as a sidewalk counselor. There were others who were trained to perform that function, but I suspect they came to their training initially as someone like me with simply a desire to support life. Perhaps you could say all I was there for was to stand and pray so that heart and turmoil might see there are other hearts who care. By ourselves, we will not win the battle between the cultures, but as we discern how we might help, as we join hands with others, as we learn and grow, we can add to the momentum of life. Let us also keep in mind the life we save today could be the life which saves another in a moment which is yet to come. Well, and once more, our time has come to an end, and we hope you'll be able to join us next time as we discuss pregnancy resource centers. And as we talk about them, we'll talk about some of the disinformation targeted against them and the truth of the services they provide, both before and after birth. We hope you'll be able to join us as we all learn and prepare ourselves with the armor of truth. Let us conclude with a prayer. 
the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to open and discuss your holy word. We pray that as we go our separate ways, you will continue to walk with us and help us to see how we may put on the armor of truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the word of the gospel, not only for the benefit of our lives, but also the lives of all who cross our path. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you all, and God bless. And Michelle, we really appreciate you joining our conversation here today, and we really appreciate the perspectives that you had to present to us. Thanks for inviting and me. Gone sound, so we've got to be gone. We'll talk to you all later. Thank you, and all goodbye. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.